So she held town hall meetings and invited her community to design their own ideal clinic. Once since, opened since 2005, Dr. Weibel's community clinic, Weibel's community clinic, has sparked a movement in which citizens are designing ideal clinics nationwide. And she actually went and traveled to town halls across the nation to find out what people want. Her model is taught in medical schools and featured in Harvard School of Public Health, Recognizing Healthcare, Resolving Conflict to Build Collaboration, a textbook examining major trends with potential change in American healthcare. Dr. Weibel is the co-author of two award-winning anthologies and the author of Hectos and Pap Smears, 101 Medical Adventures to Open Your Heart and Mind. She's been interviewed by CNN, ABC, CBS, and is a frequent guest on NPR. She also, it's not in here, but is a uh, article writer for the Oregonian as well. Today she will share how you can create your own ideal medical clinic. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you all for coming. I'm gonna start with my favorite quote. A Zen poet once said, a person who is a master in the art of living makes little distinction between their work and their play, their labor and their leisure, their mind and their body, their education and their recreation, their love and their religion. They hardly know which is which and simply pursue their vision of excellence and grace, whatever they do, leaving others to decide whether they are working or playing. To them, they are always doing both. So that's how I practice medicine. It's like a love fest party every day. And um, just imagine having so much fun at work that you don't even feel like you're at work. That is possible in healthcare. And so just a few things I'll bring up is that I haven't set an alarm for work in over nine years. I've been self-employed. I work afternoons and evenings. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really a morning person. So uh, it's great. I never really had that option when I worked for somebody else. And so I give balloons to patients and, uh, and just do wound to tomb medicine. So it's fantastic. Everyone gets balloons no matter where they are in the life cycle. <laughs> and, um, and then I only work a few half days a week because I don't really believe in uh, working so hard that I'm exhausted. And I think that we should be models of health for our patients. So to have a balanced life is actually more than just lip, lip service, you know. Recommending lifestyle and diet changes to your patients is, um, it's, it's, it's way better if you actually are modeling that versus just saying it. So what, what happened is I started realizing how much fun I was having at work and how little fun my colleagues looked like they were having at work. In fact, they looked pretty miserable. So I thought, um, and actually this happened, I, I started writing this book, Pet Goats and Pat Smears, primarily because I had medical students wanting to shadow with me, and after working with me, they would say, wow, you're the first happy doctor we've ever met. <laughs> and then they would say, we were told in medical school that being in solo practice isn't possible anymore. And so they were just kind of shocked, like on many levels, to find out that what they're taught is not true, that you actually can have a thriving solo practice and make more money than you would make working for somebody else, because you're not giving all the parasites a cut in the middle. And you can have more fun, because really, you're more likely to be a self-actualized person that reaches the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs if you work for yourself. Let's just face it. Unless you happen to find an employer that's like totally on the same page as you, which I wasn't able to do in six jobs in 10 years. I never found anyone that had the same vision as me. I think because we're all here with a unique purpose. And most of us who are called to heal have felt that spiritual calling from maybe grade school onward, and so it's, it's something, we're, we're offering ourselves in a very unique way to our 
patients. So to expect that you'd find an employer that would have the same exact healing mission as you have, like one in a million, okay? And then in a capitalistic society where, you know, hoarding money is considered the way to win in life, <laughs> you're not really gonna necessarily find somebody that aligns with you. If you're, if you're focusing on life from a place of meaning and spirituality, it's really hard to find that in a capitalistic medical system. So anyway, I wrote this book, and it just has like my best 101 patient stories from 20 years of being a doctor, mostly in an ideal medical practice, so that people could, it's like chicken soup for the doctor's soul without sacrificing the chicken. And um, <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, there's, there's actually, I went to all these book marketing events, and then they, they want us to, to kind of locate where in the bookstore our books should be sold, but there's, there's no location for happy, uplifting medical books in the bookstore. Um, in Barnes and Noble, like, it's a very few books in healthcare that are really uplifting and inspiring, and so um, it might be the first in its own genre of um, happy, half smear books. So, um, which this is actually uh, a, a real picture in my office. This was not photoshopped, like the goat was actually there. So, um, and she's a medical student on the front who actually goes to medical school in Chicago, and she studies at a Chinese medical school there. And so, she's one of you. Um, anyway, so I wrote this book, and I was super excited to like get it out to everyone. It's kind of like it felt like I was a little proselytizer, you know? Wow, look, we could be having fun. Isn't this great? And I was just like really excited to finally have something to give people. And then two days later, after I published this on September 29th, 2012, one of the pediatricians in our town shot himself in the head in the middle of the day in a public park. And so I guess I finally understood, like, it's really hard to inspire people who are so far gone. You know what I mean? I'm like in a profession of allopathic doctors who are like basically PTSD'd out, you know? Like, I don't know if you've been to an allopathic doctor lately, but like, is anyone home? Like, their eyes are glazed over. They look like they're suffering more than, I mean, it's, it's really sad, because I love my profession. Both my parents are doctors, and I see the potential of what medicine can be, and it's heartbreaking for me to see my colleagues in so much distress. And so, I have, um, like I carry around with me, you know, the man, you know, I never met him, but you know, here's, here's the pediatrician in my town who, who took his own life and left like four children and uh, all his pediatric patients who adore him. He was like voted one of the top doctors in Eugene. You know, these are um, well-respected, well-loved people. Why, why are they killing themselves? And at his memorial service, I realized that, oh wow, both the men I dated in med school are dead. So that was kind of like a shock, because I thought, oh, maybe they're suicides too, which actually they turned out to be um, drug overdoses, which it was really hard to get a confirmation that that's what it was, because nobody likes to talk about it, because, you know, it's like you could burn in hell forever if you're the religion that believes that, or, you know, it's just there's stigma, you know, about discussing mental health in any real way. So anyway, I, you know, carry their pictures around with me, and it's, you know, these are all, these two, I, I dated these people, I love these people, and they're not here, and it's tragic that this is, um, this is the state of allopathic medicine right now, is we lose like 400 physicians per year to suicide, which the average doctor has a patient panel of 2,500, so it's like, wow, nearly a million Americans are gonna lose their doctor to suicide this year. Anyway, this isn't supposed to be a depressing talk, but I'm just trying to say like, this is kind of what I was up against when I was like, hey, we should be having fun. Like, it didn't register, okay? So it's good that I'm talking to you now before you start into your practice because I think a lot of people, especially in allopathic medicine, do sustain more trauma when they actually go into their practice because they keep thinking the light will be at the end of the tunnel, meaning after 
my first year of medical school will get better. After the second year of medical school, it'll get better. <laughs> At when I start residency, it will finally get better. It like never gets better for lots of people, and they start their first job where they think they could finally be a doctor, and it doesn't get better because they're working for, let's just face it, like abusive employers, and it's like being in an abusive marriage that you can't get out of. And by that time, people are in survival mode. It's really hard to um, convince them that there's another way because they're not home, you know? So they need like intense therapy and things like that. So it's great, you guys are still in school and you can take this all in before you make any mistakes and go down a path that would be uh, hurtful uh, to your soul. And I think your program is probably just less brutal with allopathic medical training programs, I hope. You're getting enough sleep and that you get to do yoga and get free massages, and, <laughs> right? That you have to do massage, wouldn't it be cool if we had to do massage as part of our training in allopathic medical school? Anyway, so I thought I'd share a few stories from the book just so um, you could understand what a typical day is like for me in my practice. Has anyone read this book in the room? Like four or five people? Okay, great. Um, so it will be available at the end if anyone wants one. I think I'm just gonna sell them for $10 each or something. So um, I sign every book, I kiss every book, like I say at night, <laughs> and I kiss them with my own lips. <laughs> This is my relationship right now with this book. And so, <laughs> and so anyway, let's see. So there's a chapter, I think it's chapter four maybe, called Forget the, Forget the ER, Try the DMV. So what happened is that I was just at the YMCA one day uh, in the dressing room. It was like my day off. People think when you're self-employed that you're, it's going to be miserable, like you'll never be able to get away from your patients because you're the only one and they're going to call you all the time and they're going to really get on your nerves. It's going to be like having 2,500 really nagging children hanging around your feet, you know, <laughs> which if you're in a functional practice, you teach your patients to be really functional and they don't bother you on your time off for the most part. And, you have long enough appointments that you answer all their questions so you don't get stray phone calls at all hours of the night. Anyway, but this gentleman injured his finger and he called me wanting an appointment. And so I was like naked in the YMCA dressing room just trying to figure out uh, how I was gonna see him for an appointment. And then I realized like from there I was going to the DMV to do my, um, renew my driver's license. And I knew that he lived near the West Side DMV in Eugene, and so I thought, you know, just quick thinking, because you know your patients. I thought, well, instead of him driving all the way to South Eugene, which is really not that far, like Portland is much bigger. <laughs> so instead of driving the extra five minutes to South Eugene, like he could just meet me at the DMV, and I'll examine his finger there, <laughs> because like I knew he didn't need stitches from what he was talking about on the phone. It was more like, does he need antibiotics for an infection? So um, when I told him to meet me at the DMV, he was like super excited because it turns out he needed to transfer a car title. <laughs> so wow, we took the same number and sat next to each other. I examined his finger and he didn't need antibiotics and everything was happily ever after and he didn't have insurance, he paid me like 50 bucks. And then my license renewal was 40, so I like made 10 dollars <laughs> sitting at the DMV. And then when they called our number, we both went up to the front, and he was like super excited. You know, everyone at the DMV is usually like, you know, <laughs> even the people that work there are sort of like, uh, you know, so, but everyone was laughing and smiling because he explained how he just had his medical appointment in the waiting room. And it was just like the coolest thing ever. So, like, um, think out of the box. Like, it's sometimes easier to have your medical appointments in a park or in a swimming pool or somewhere else besides your actual office since um, it can be more convenient and more healing depending on the weather and all that. So that's one fun story. Um, I've done a lot of other appointments like in grocery stores and in, in the YMCA and other places. And, um, and then there's a, a little, let's see, there's a, there's a chapter called Soap Opera. And most of the chapters, by the way, are like one or three pages now of cartoons. Perfect bathroom reading. Um, so anyway, the soap opera story is, uh, like I have a gift basket by my door in my office because in case I run late, I like to be able to give people a gift. You know, instead of just saying, I'm sorry I'm late, I'm sorry I'm late, I'm sorry I'm late, which was like my standard line for like 10 years working at other clinics. Like I never thought, oh, let me give them a door prize or do something more than to say, I'm sorry, I'm late. You know, so, 
I, I thought, okay, this is great. I can go to Saturday Market and basically support local artisans who are making these amazing soaps and lotions. So it's all like body care products and cool stuff that people, you know, could use anyway. So I'm supporting, um, you know, local the local economy, and I am allowing people to pick a gift that's worth like maybe five dollars or less. You know, I have a lot of goats milk soap in there. I, I somehow just really glommed on to goats lately, <laughs> and so. So anyway, people will come in, like if I'm, if I'm more than 10 minutes late, they get a gift. And it's really cool because like sometimes you open a chart and you realize it's the patient's birthday, but you didn't come prepared with a present, but they can pick something from the gift basket or like uh, it's their anniversary or some other you know, milestone or they quit smoking, you know, and so you wanna give them a gift and now you're all set up. And so sometimes if I'm nine minutes late, I'll wait an extra minute just because it's so much fun to give gifts, you know what I mean? And they get balloons sometimes too on patient appreciation days. So anyway, what was really funny about the soap opera story is that I guess like somebody in New York City, a reporter found out I was doing this and it was like, they were like, wow, a doctor is giving gifts to patients and it like totally made the national news. You know what I mean? That's like how far gone we are. Like, so out of touch, <laughs> like helping people, like the idea of giving somebody like a pretty cheap gift for just being late is like amazing enough that like this reporter was calling me from New York, from Manhattan, wanting to do a story on it. And, and so that the day that he called, I just happened to be late, like at the end of the day. So I, I think I had two patients that um, I could have potentially, they wanted to interview actual patients, not just taking my word for it that I'm doing this. And so I called up this woman and she's like kind of high anxiety, low self-esteem, you know, woman who like was just, uh, she just couldn't believe that I was asking her if she wanted to be interviewed on national news. Um, and she's like, about what? I said about, I said, did, did you got a bar of soap today, right? And she goes, yeah, I love it. It's like really expensive. My husband won't let me have that kind of soap. Oh my God, it smells so good. You know, I've been carrying around all day. I'm like, great. Well, do you want to talk to a reporter from New York about what? about the soap. And she's like, oh my God, on national TV? And I'm like, no, really? It's just going to be a print article. And she's like, okay. About the soap? You know, and she just couldn't believe it. But she did finally get interviewed on how she got a bar of soap for me. And it was like in a major national health of daily out of Manhattan, you know, which, which then my residency program found out about. And they all passed it around, you know, like this is one of our residents, you know. We're so proud of her. She's some soap out to her patients. <laughs> so um, I will just drive home the point that it doesn't take much to be newsworthy. Just do something original. <laughs> you know, you don't really have to do much. You know what I mean? Like that was kind of mild, I'm thinking, but it made enough news. And so that was super funny. Um, and then there was a day, and this was in my traditional like uh, assembly line job where I went to work and somebody had left like a box of kittens by the door, like abandoned. And so I brought them in and made a little like fun circus play area in my office. And then I took a sign, uh, a white piece of paper and just wrote free clinic, uh, free kittens with physical today only. <laughs> we got in front of the clinic and like they all got homes by 11 a.m. <laughs> and like everyone got their physicals. It was super cool. So like think out of the box, like how can you work with the Humane Society in your office? And like, you know, like pets are healing and they're wondering how to get homes for these animals. And I'm sure you tell people, have you thought about getting a dog or staring at a goldfish that might help your blood pressure? I don't know, bring them into your office and send them home with a pet if you feel like they can handle it. Um, so anyway, that was super cool. And then, let's see, uh, I started having pet parties in my office because I realized people are nervous for their exams and they would rather do it in groups, you know what I mean? So I started having women that came in together for their um, exams. So I bring balloons and party hats and like, you know, you can accomplish the same amount of work with a party hat and it makes it so much more fun. Like I don't know why people don't think about that. You know what I mean? I think it, I mean, I keep Mardi Gras beads by my pack supplies. <laughs> and every time I go anywhere, I'm looking for little things that I could put in my office that would make people laugh. And of course you have to pick the right person with the right gag gift. 
You know what I mean? That's the art of medical practice. Like, I went to a, <laughs> I went to like a, a party supply store, and you know how they have all those awards, like first place, second place, you know, for like little kids, you know? They had one that said the Clean Room Award. I just put it in my passport drawer, because I knew like the right woman would come by, and she'd be like, I don't know, something might be wrong, and I could tell her everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I get the Clean Room Award. <laughs> and I'm like, they think it's great, you know what I mean? So I did that like two weeks ago. I don't even give away, I mean, if they want to take it home, they can, but most of the time I just recycle it. I like say, hey, you know, I, I, you know. <laughs> I only have one of those versions, but. Okay, so um, then I also, like, okay, so here's an interesting thing, since we all talk about integrated medicine. So it's really interesting when people say, well, try integrated medicine, and you're not even integrating yourself. You know what I mean? Your life's a mess. You don't know where you're going. You're depressed or you don't have a clear idea of your destiny and your profession. You know that you're telling somebody else integrated medicine. Like I'm just suggesting why don't we be integrated as people ourselves and just be a role model for how to be integrated, you know? And then if you really think your patient needs something like massage or acupuncture or whatever, you know, I, I, I've told people over and over again, you know, try massage, but they don't necessarily go out and try a massage because they're scared, they don't you know if they take their clothes off, they don't really understand what's going to happen, some people are un don't have the money, you know what I mean, they don't even know where you would find a massage therapist, even in Oregon where every other person is a massage therapist. So I uh, brought a massage therapy student into my office and just paid her like whatever, $40 an hour, or, you know, there's lots of students that just want to come volunteer with you and just do stuff, even for free or low cost, you know? So I just had her massage my patient's hands and feet like during their appointments. That's integrative medicine. You know, you're actually doing it at the same time. You're not like, oh, get your pap smear here. Then um, go Google a massage therapist or even go down the hallway and knock on Kate's door and get a massage. Like that's not exactly integrated. That's like doing things one at a time in a row and I don't even know what they're doing because they might not even listen to so you bring the people to them that they need, right? So I scheduled all my high need psych patients who are on like OHP all on one day, and they all got hand and feet massages, you know? Which was great, because some of them said that was the first time they ever experienced safe touch in their life. They didn't really request many drugs that day. You know, it was great for me during the visits, because I was like, so what else is going on? And they're like, they didn't have a lot to say. They were like <laughs> super happy, so they weren't like, clinging to me as much and needing drugs that I know won't help them. They finally felt safe in their bodies and it was cool. And you can think about how can I integrate things together for people? Like do the extra brain work to bring people together and offer services at the same time instead of thinking that some people can handle doing this on their own. Okay, and then um, Oh, patient appreciation days, I totally recommend it. Just, you know, on random Fridays, and sometimes I do it every day of the week, I have balloons and chocolates, and people, like, when they come in, they get a balloon, and I get all different, I go to the dollar store, right? It's really cheap. And I get all different, like, I know who's coming in, and I know these people, so I know what balloon should say what, and who should get what balloon. You know, like, I know who needs a get well balloon, and I know who needs, it's your special day and I know he needs a heart. Sometimes I let them pick, but it's really cool because I'll go out and welcome them and I'll say, it's your special day. You know, and they're so excited because they're adults who get to leave a medical visit with a balloon, which only we keep thinking, like children are the ones that need stickers. Like if you look around at people, like I think adults look way more depressed than children. <laughs> <laughs> adults are the ones that need all the Cracker Jack prizes and the things that are free and cereal boxes and balloons and stickers because we're actually not having as much fun as we should. That's my thing. Okay, so um, I am, this is gonna be really interactive. I'm gonna answer all your questions uh, before I leave in uh, an hour. Uh, is when this is going to be over, but I'll stay as long as it takes to answer everyone's questions. Like sometimes I've stayed two hours and sat in the hallway and answered people's questions, so I don't know how much time you have, but I, 
I try to be really fast paced and get a lot of info out. So if you want to take notes, go for it. I'm going to cover everything that was promised in the little flyer. So let's see. First, I, um, I have to say I reviewed your catalog, and it looks like you guys get a lot more practice management uh, than any doctor I know in medical school, you know, any medical student, which is kind of depressing again for allopaths because you guys really understand how to run a business when you graduate, and we still are clueless because we don't get trained in practice management as well as you do. So congratulations. Um, you guys should be really successful. You're ahead of us. But um, so what I promised is that, you know, you should be able to claim your vision and liberate yourself to practice medicine in alignment with your values and the values of your community, how to engage your community, and how to thrill patients and staff, and it's super easy to do that. All you have to do is lead a town hall meeting, which doesn't have to be as scary as it sounds. Like, some people are not public speakers. They don't really want to do, like, a town hall meeting. But you know what? I just have to say, if you go out and try to lead a town hall meeting, you'll probably have more people show up to hear you than like John McCain had for most of his presidential town halls. Because they had to bust people in from nursing homes and stuff. And fill, you know what I mean? Like fake fill the room. You know? And sometimes it was super embarrassing because it was a stadium they rented and they could only focus on one row. You know what I mean? So like, I know like we don't generally in medical school get trained in community organizing, but if like a doctor really went out and said I care about my community and my neighborhood and I want to know what you want, like you would have so many more people show up for your authentic request than uh, for politicians, you know, pretty much. So, and if you're not comfortable with like a town hall meeting, you know, like the typical version, you could have a community visioning circle with your friends. You could have, you go to a neighborhood center. You could, you have to figure out who you want to serve. Like if you're only into pediatrics, like maybe you ought to go visit a school. Just call a teacher up, like a fourth grade teacher, like I've done, and say, I want to see what your fourth graders, how they would design their ideal clinic, and spend like a, a, an afternoon with them. It only takes like an hour, really. You pass out pens and papers and say, hey, what would a clinic look like if you could design it? And you get all this great idea, you know, and you get them for free without paying a $400 per hour consultant, which is what doctors generally do when they open a clinic. They're like, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm getting any practice management in medical school, so let me get ripped off and hire somebody for $400 an hour to tell me what to do. And then they basically tell you to do the same thing that's not working that's making all the other doctors depressed. You know, so, which is like, hire more staff, bring in more phone lines. It's like, well, that's the problem. Like, how many phone lines do you need to be happy? And more staff is not going to make you happy. You know, in my opinion, whatever. Okay, so I did these town hall meetings and it just really clarified what I needed to be doing because like before this I was getting kind of depressed because I was working at all these different jobs and I just felt like the grass would be greener at the next one but they were all like assembly line medicine, production line style clinics which I was like, that was never my concept of what I wanted to be. When I grew up I never wanted to be a factory worker. If I wanted to do that I'd work at Toyota. Like I didn't want to do that by being a doctor because I wanted to like have time to really heal people, but that's not really part of what doctors get to do with their job descriptions now. So I just thought, well, let me just ask patients what they want because it's not working for me and they don't look very happy, you know. So I just went and did like nine town hall meetings and I kind of call it that because I feel like what I did was politically subversive and it was like a town hall meeting even though like probably between four and 30 people showed up for each one. Like some of them were small and just somebody's living room down the street and some of them were at community centers. And, but I got like 100 pages of written testimony which I will pass around that you could read, but it's super cool what people want. Because they want exactly what you want to give them. They want a sanctuary, a safe place, a place of wisdom, a place where we can learn to live harmlessly, listen with empathy, observe without judgment, a place where a revolution starts, a new way of seeing, and a place where we learn to live and a place to learn to die. I mean, it's really beautiful what people would like you to be giving them that we're somehow, most of us, not doing. Uh, the doctor is waiting for me when I arrive, and that's a great idea. Instead of making the patient wait, you know, just be ready. Like, that would, that would shock them, you know, really. At the patient appreciation day thing, sometimes people pick me out randomly from an insurance, like, uh, list of doctors. They don't even know who I am. And then they come and they get a balloon and chocolates and a present and an hour-long visit, and they're like, oh my god, I hit the lottery. <laughs> and I'm like, 
I guess you did. You know, because they just randomly picked me out of their Pacific Scores, you know, list of primary care providers. Anyway, minimum of 30 minutes per, vis per visit. The doctor is happy. These are just like random things that I think are cool that people wrote down. And um, healing is not symptom suppression. Work with the body, not drug people beyond recognition. No high front counters and benches separating people from people. A lounge of sorts, sofas, not hard chairs. So like, if you want to know how to set up a clinic, like literally, just go ask fourth graders. <laughs> I mean, it's super easy. Like, they want comfortable chairs and fun colors and balloons, and it's like, I don't know why we have to teach adults this. It seems like a no-brainer in retrospect, but people just want to be having fun, and that's actually part of healing. Like having fun and leaving your appointment laughing is a really good idea for the doctor and the patient, you know? Um, I'd like to be treated as a peer and not a commodity. Overstuffed chairs eliminate the medical assistant who weighs and measures and takes notes that the doctor doesn't read anyway. You know, like it's kind of common sense and cool, and I'll just pass this around and feel free to steal ideas from there or have your own meeting somewhere. 